Good afternoon. NATO defense ministers have uh, met to address key issues for our security. This includes stepping up our support for Ukraine, strengthening our deterrence and defense with the right forces, capabilities and stockpiles, and uh, protecting our critical infrastructure by strengthening our military planning and our cooperation with uh, industry. It is almost uh, one year since uh, Russia launched its full-fledged invasion of Ukraine, the biggest conflict in Europe since World War II. And we see no signs that Russia is preparing for peace. On the contrary, Russia is launching new uh, offensives. Yesterday, Defence Minister Resnikov updated NATO ministers on the situation and Ukraine's most urgent needs. I welcome the new pledges uh, of support made by NATO allies, including more heavy weapons and military training. This is critical. Ukraine has a window of opportunity to tip the balance, and time is of the essence. I want to thank uh, allies for their significant contributions, including to NATO's comprehensive assistance package. This is providing Ukraine with food, fuel, medical supplies, counter drone systems and um, amphibious bridges. Ministers also discussed our commitment to our, to our other partners at risk, including Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia and Moldova, and we agreed to step up tailored support to enhance their defence capabilities, resilience and interoperability with NATO. Today, Allies took uh, steps to further strengthen NATO's deterrence and defence. Since our historic Madrid summit, we have been making good progress, boosting our forward defences and upgrading our readiness and defence plans. Allies agreed new guidance for NATO's defence planning. This reflects the reality that we live in a more dangerous world. With Russia's aggressive uh, behaviour, the persistent threat of terrorism and the challenges posed by China. NATO's defence planning will drive capability changes for the years to come and ensure that our deterrence and defence remain strong and credible. Ministers also addressed ways to boost industrial capacity and replenish stockpiles of armaments and munitions. NATO allies are providing unprecedented support to help Ukraine push back against Russia's aggression. At the same time, this is consuming an enormous quantity of allied ammunition and depleting our stockpiles. Allies agree on the need to work hand in hand with the defence industry to ramp up our industrial, industrial capacity. We are ready uh, 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 and we are reviewing NATO capability targets for munition stockpiles. And I welcome the important multinational projects agreed by allies today. These include a project on, uh, on ammunition warehousing, which will uh, support the pre-positioning and stockpiling of allied ammunition, as well as a project on ground-based air defence. Today, uh, ministers also addressed the uh, security of critical undersea infrastructure. The sabotage of the North Stream pipelines has reminded us all of the vulnerabilities we face. Ministers tasked the NATO military authorities to provide advice on what more we should do including through better coordination and cooperation with the private sector. And I am standing up a critical undersea infrastructure coordination cell here at the NATO headquarters, led by Lieutenant General Hans Werner Biermann, a highly respected former German military officer. I will, uh, it will facilitate engagement with industry and bring key military and civilian stakeholders together to share best practices, leverage innovative technologies, and boost the security of our undersea infrastructure. At our summit in Vilnius, leaders will take further decisions to ensure that NATO can effectively coordinate between military, 
civilian and private sector uh, to secure our critical undersea infrastructure. As we continue to adapt uh, our alliance, we need to have the right resources. So ministers also discussed the importance of investing in defence. More countries are now spending at least 2% of the GDP on defence. And 2022 was the eighth consecutive year of increased defence spending by European allies and Canada, with an additional investment of $350 billion. This trend is expected to continue this year, but more needs to be done. So today, allies discussed how to build on the Defence Investment Pledge and future uh, commitments beyond 2024. NATO leaders will take decisions on this at our next summit in Vilnius. With that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, let's start with the BBC. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. Uh, Jonathan Beale, BBC News. Um, you started this uh, meeting and, and, and the head of the contact group saying that you're making the point that Ukraine is using and Russia are using huge amounts of ammunition. You repeated that just now. <clears throat> and you warned about NATO's own stockpiles of ammunition, that production needed to be ramped up. First of all, have any countries actually now committed to ramp up their production, apart from the US and France, which you mentioned earlier, signing a new contract? And the, and the second question is, is, you know, we get a message from uh, Lord Austin, the US Defence Secretary, that Ukraine is getting what it needs. But what you're suggesting is that Ukraine might not get what it needs, that it will run out of artillery shells, tank shells, for example. So are you worried that Ukraine could run out of ammunition in the coming months? Thank you. So what we see is uh, an enormous uh, expenditure of ammunition, uh, and we have seen that for several months. And that's also the reason why we actually started to address that last fall. Uh, we, we, we convened uh, with uh, meetings with the defence industry. We addressed uh, this issue uh, in different NATO capitals. And now we see that things are actually moving in the right direction. Um, yes, uh, the United States, France have signed the contracts, but also other allies, Germany, Norway, and there are also others who have already signed contracts with the defence industry, meaning that production is now ramping up. And, uh, and, and that is making a huge difference. And partly it's possible to increase uh, production from the existing uh, 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 sort of factories, uh, capabilities. But of course, uh, you also need to make new investments. That will take some more time. Uh, but actually, both things are now happening, utilizing existing capacity more and investing in new production uh, uh, capacity. Um, so the production, for instance, um, Artillery shells, the 155, is now uh, uh, increasing, and that enables us to uh, both uh, replenish our own uh, stocks, which we have depleted, but also to continue to provide uh, support uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. Um, uh, we also do this by working together. Allies are jointly uh, addressing the need to also uh, joint procurement uh, to, to make big orders from the industry. Uh, to utilize the economy of scale uh, and, uh, and, uh, and to place bigger orders and to give the defense industry the long-term uh, demand and the, and the long-term uh, uh, contracts. So yes, things are happening, uh, but we need to continue, we need to uh, step uh, up even more because there is a, a big need out there uh, to provide um, Ukraine with uh, ammunition. This is now becoming a, a grinding war of attrition and the war of attrition is a war of logistics, and, uh, and, uh, and therefore this is uh, so crucial for uh, our ability to uh, ensure that Ukraine wins, is able to retake territory and launch offensives that uh, ensures that uh, 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 it's able to, to, to win the war and to prevail as a sovereign independent nation. So, yeah. so you're not worried that Ukraine will run out of so we, we have seen the, the big need, and that's exactly what we have, why we have uh, uh, reacted uh, several months ago, and now we see that contracts are signed, uh, production is ramping up, and, and allies are producing more uh, to be able to continue to support uh, Ukraine. Uh, TT News Agency from Sweden. 
Victor Nemlin, Swedish news agency, TT. <clears throat> Following your doorstep yesterday, there's been uh, a lot of speculation if there's a new line on the membership process for Finland and Sweden. So, just to clarify, if there would be a ratification <coughs> for one of the countries, would NATO go through and complete the complete process for membership? Or would you still wait in order to get everything clear with both countries at the same time? So, Finland and Sweden, they apply together. Uh, and uh, all NATO allies made an historic decision together, all 30, to invite Finland and Sweden uh, at our uh, summit in Madrid. And then all allies, all 30 allies, also Turkey, signed the two accession protocols together. And I made it clear actually last fall when I went to Turkey in, uh, in October that, uh, that uh, both Finland and Sweden has now fulfilled their obligations um, uh, in the uh, joint trilateral memorandum they signed with Turkey in, in July. So I, I, I urged uh, uh, Turkey to, to, to ratify both Finland and Sweden together already last fall. So that's my position. That position not, has not changed. But at the same time, uh, we have also uh, seen that there are uh, uh, different uh, assessments in Turkey uh, about to, uh, to what extent Finland and Sweden or so say, are uh, uh, in the same position to be ratified. And that is a Turkish uh, decision. Turkey has, Turkey has two documents, one accession protocol with Finland and one accession protocol uh, with Sweden. So the decisions we need to take as allies, 30 allies, have already been taken. 30 allies invited Sweden and Finland, and 30 allies uh, signed the accession protocols. Now it's for the individual allies to ratify. 28 allies have already ratified both protocols, um, uh, and then uh, Hungary and Turkey has not. Uh, and therefore it is for uh, Turkey to decide whether they ratified both, and I have recommended that, or whether they ratify only one of the two documents. That's not a NATO decision. It's a decision by Turkey. So again, my position is that both Finland and Sweden are ready for membership. Both accession protocols uh, should be uh, ratified by all allies. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it is a decision by Turkey whether they ratify one or uh, both of them. But then, but, then the, but then the process is completed. There, there is no need for any unanimous decision anymore by NATO. We have made the decision. We have invited both at the same time. So, 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 so when Turkey uh, ratifies, then the process is completed. As, as long as also, of course, uh, Hungary and also Finland and Sweden do what they are uh, also now in the process of, uh, of uh, doing. So, so this idea that there is a need for a new and uh, an unanimous decision by NATO is wrong. Th there are decisions that have to be taken by, by the individual allies, and two allies are not yet ratified. And of course, again, I, I have urged them for many months to ratify both at the same time. <laughs> and that's still my position. It has never changed. I've been actually pushing hard for Swedish and, and, and Finnish me membership. And, uh, and I am absolutely confident that both Finland and Sweden will become a member. Uh, at the same time, the sequencing is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that both Finland and Sweden uh, soon uh, become uh, uh, members of the alliance. And I, I'll push hard for that. I also actually travel to, to, uh, uh, to Turkey tomorrow. Uh, and uh, that will be one of the issues I certainly will uh, uh, address. And <laughs> Ömer Turulcan with Turkish News Agency Anadolu. Secretary General, could you please uh, give us the latest information about the relief efforts, NATO's relief efforts uh, for the victims of the earthquakes in Turkey? <coughs> All allies expressed their uh, deepest condolences and uh, uh, support to uh, Turkey, our ally, and, uh, and the deepest condolences for the loss of lives in Turkey and, uh, and Syria caused by the terrible uh, earthquake uh, last week. Uh, and uh, uh, NATO allies, uh, partners and NATO has, uh, have stepped up their support uh, and are providing different types of uh, relief support. Uh, and uh, NATO has also decided to deploy 
um, shelters uh, to accommodate uh, people who have been uh, displaced. And, uh, and, uh, and we will, uh, the plan is to transport this uh, within a few days uh, to uh, Turkey. Um, uh, tomorrow uh, I will be in Turkey to meet with President Erdogan and Minister Shaushoglu uh, and express my solidarity, my condolences, and uh, uh, to continue to uh, uh, address with them how NATO and NATO allies uh, can provide uh, relief support and uh, help alleviate the, the suffering and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the consequences of the terrible uh, earthquake. Uh, so uh, so I, I, I thank allies for the support they have provided. Actually, I ended the meeting today uh, to call on allies to uh, provide even more support. There is an urgent need for more strategic airlift. Uh, NATO allies have provided strategic airlift. We need more airlift to, to actually bring in tents uh, and, uh, and, and, and relief uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine. And we started also the meeting uh, yesterday with, uh, with a moment of silence uh, in, uh, in solidarity uh, with uh, the victims of the earthquake. Okay, we'll go to Kiev Post. Thank you, Anna. <clears throat> uh, Secretary General, thank you. Uh, Alex uh, Bobrovnikov, Kiev Post, Ukraine. I, firstly, there's, a, there's an ongoing a talk uh, of the open doors policies of NATO, while Ukraine being a spear head, a spear force of uh, the anti totalitarian war happening right now. Uh, we still are in a situation where there's, there's new, no news on potential membership to Ukraine. I, do you feel like during your stay as a Secretary General this historical shift may happen uh, through the membership action plan or any other facility, uh, this old-fashioned uh, ways of uh, uh, NATO's uh, developing its potential and future partners? That's one thing, one question, and the second one would be on due diligence of uh, allied help to Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Reznikov has flagged yesterday that this is an ongoing talk on uh, uh, basically, uh, so to say, due diligence or checking the, uh, the situation there with the, how the, the assets were used. Uh, where do we stand on that and what's, uh, what, we, what, what we can expect? Thank you. So first of all, uh, on membership, what I have demonstrated and what NATO analysts have demonstrated over the last years is that NATO's door is open. Uh, we have uh, two new members, uh, Montenegro and North Macedonia. Both time Russia protested heavily, but the uh, allies and, and these individual countries decided uh, their own path and, uh, and, uh, and, and we invited them and they are now members. Then uh, Finland and Sweden are very close to membership. Uh, uh, they are now uh, uh, invited to the alliance, they participate in NATO structures meetings, uh, they are at the NATO table, they are more and more integrated into uh, NATO's uh, uh, civilian and military structures, including defense planning. So, so, so we are very close to also have uh, uh, two more Finland and Sweden as, uh, as full-fledged uh, members. Uh, on Ukraine, NATO's position has not changed. Um, uh, we have reiterated many times that uh, Ukraine will become a, a, a member of the alliance, but the focus now is to ensure that Ukraine wins the war. Because the only way to, to, to integrate and to, and, uh, and to ensure that, uh, that, that Ukraine can move towards uh, uh, Euro-Atlantic cooperation, closer Euro-Atlantic cooperation, is to ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent nation. So the urgent, the, the, the main focus of NATO allies is to ensure that Ukraine gets the weapons, the supplies, the ammunition they need uh, to push back the Russian uh, in, uh, invaders. Um, and we're also working on more long-term uh, partnership, uh, helping Ukraine to, um, to, 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 to move from Soviet era weapons, doctrines, uh, uh, standards to NATO standards, to improve interoperability on security and defense reform, and all of that will move Ukraine uh, uh, closer to uh, the NATO uh, alliance. Um, uh, then, of course, w w the best proof that, that the support works and it's actually um, uh, helping Ukraine is the progress Ukraine has uh, uh, delivered on the battlefield. Um, uh, and, uh, and allies are also, of course, uh, constantly working with the Ukrainian authorities to ensure that all the money, all the funding ends up where it should. Okay. But that's, also, we have very close contact with them. We are working on that uh, all the time uh, to ensure that... Uh, that uh, we have the necessary oversight and transparency. Uh, yeah, but that's the way we are ensuring that that's happening. Okay, 
Uh, Natalia Drozdjak from Bloomberg. I wanted to ask on defense spending. You said before that allies are increasingly seeing 2% of um, GDP as a floor and not a ceiling. And after the discussions today, do you have any sense of whether that 2% figure could increase uh, when, when leaders agreed to the new pledge this summer? Thanks. So what, what we had now was the initial discussion among allies on what should be the new defense investment pledge. Because in 2014, NATO allies made a pledge to move towards spending 2% of GDP uh, on defence uh, uh, by 2024. So when we meet this, uh, this uh, summer, in July, in Vilnius, we need to make a new pledge. Um, and that's obvious because the current one is actually running out. Um, uh, this, uh, what we had today, was the initial discussion. And of course, we didn't uh, conclude. Uh, the conclusions are going to be drawn at the summit later on. Uh, but what is obvious is that if it was right to commit to spend uh, 2% in 2014, it is even more right now, because we live in a more dangerous world. There is a full-fledged war going on uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, in, uh, in Europe, and then we see the persistent uh, threat of terrorism, and we see also the, the challenges that China is posing uh, to our uh, security. So it is obvious that we need to spend more, um, and um, my, uh, what should I say, uh, thinking around this is that instead of changing the 2%, I think we should move from uh, regarding the 2% as a ceiling to regard the 2% of GDP as a floor, a minimum, uh, and to have a stronger commitment uh, and not a long-term perspective or move towards, but actually uh, that we need uh, 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 immediate uh, 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 commitment to spend 2% as a minimum because uh, we, we, when we see the needs uh, for ammunition, for air defence, for training, for readiness, uh, for high-end capabilities, it's obvious that 2% uh, that, uh, uh, defence spending is the minimum. Thank you very much. I know there are lots more questions. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Thank you. Thank you.